So everything that, that, that you type, everything that you say will be part of that recording that will be available for folks to, to check out later. Uh, unless you are actually speaking or are asking a question, please leave your microphone off. In the bottom left-hand corner, you have a box that has a picture of a microphone. It's gray when it's off, and when it's on, it's yellow. So you'll know whether you're um, talking and being projected to everyone or not. Would would greatly appreciate all of the agents logging into the wiki at the end of the of the program and and making note of how many agents, how many master gardeners, and how many other people participated in the program. These numbers are really important to us. They're important to the speakers to be able to to keep a record of, of the outreach that they're having. They're really important as we're trying to get funding to get uh, you guys microphones and other uh, tools that will make this a more uh, effective strategy for connecting. So please take a couple minutes to help us gather that data. All of the information that you need about the, the plants, pests, and pathogens is available on our website. The website link is, is right here. Um, it, on the screen in, in front of you. That is where the link will be to any handouts or to, to the recorded sessions. Um, so if you go there, um, you'll be able to find what, you, what anything you need to know about the clinic. Today's program is, is really exciting. We've got Donna Teasley from Burke County who's going to be talking to, to us uh, about some um, turf issues. Will Hooker is here from the Department of Horticulture to talk about permaculture, and we have our, our standard experts talking about current diseases, uh, Mike Munster and current insect issues, uh, Dave Stefan. Our technology wizard today is Lee J. Hicks. Uh, here's her phone number and her email address. If you have any technical problems, please contact Lee J. and she can help you out. Okay, first up is uh, Donna Teasley. Donna is a horticulture agent in Burke County, and she has some agent insights to share this morning. Donna, I'm going to turn it over to you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I'm the agent in Burke County, and we're a Foothills County. We're in Western North Carolina, and our fair is over. It was last week, so this is a really great day. So, so this this may have been a little impromptu, um, but I had a good reason. So, but the fair is over, and so it's all good. This morning, I'm going to talk about brown patch because, as a consumer horticulture agent, I get lots and lots of calls about that. Um, you know, brown patch, um, and he's and we have one slide up here, as you can see, um, it does affect both cool season and warm season grasses. The majority of the grasses we have here in Burke County are cool season, so I'm mostly going to talk about that, but I do have a few things about warm season grasses. Um, Brown patch um, really does a job on, on fescue lawns, which is what we have mostly here in Burke County. It can start out um, as, as a small area and um, then get to about three feet, and then all these different areas sort of join together, and you just have these big patches, and the, the clients start to call. And I find that the most of the time when they call, they think they have grubs. And so you have to explain to them, well, it could be lots of things. And for example, people that are calling now, I tell them it can't be grubs because there just aren't any large grubs in the soil right now. So I also tell them, I think Lucy has another slide, to look at the blades of grass. And, and when you have brown patch, one of the things you're going to see are these little light brown spots with a dark halo around. Them. And also, the grass is going to have a very dark look. Sometimes it has a grayish look. Um, and whenever we start with brown patch here, it really seems to spread quickly. I noticed that um, whenever I first start getting my brown patch calls, it's when we have our first two or three weeks of really hot, humid weather, usually late June. Um, and brown patch occurs around here when we start getting those nighttime temperatures over 65. And we start getting the 85 degree days where the humidity is high. And, um, and you know, it's just the hot, muggy summer. Um, 
and I try to explain to people, one of the first questions I ask is, is when did you fertilize last? And of course, the majority of people are going to tell me April, May, sometimes even June. And then I will talk to them about all the obvious things about brown patch and um, you know the need to fertilize early so your your high levels of nitrogen have um, are down somewhat by the time hot weather gets here. But most people that call me, they they really want a quick fix, and that's been a big problem because can't give them a quick fix because um, a disease is really hard after it gets established in your lawn. I think diseases are harder than insects personally, but um, I try to every year we talk about this and and. In years past, I've always had a really hard time giving them any type of a solution. But the, one of the things I, I really wanted to tell you about this morning was a new product on the market. And this product um, was actually introduced last October. And I really didn't see it in any stores until this year. And it's a product called Maxide. Um, it's Maxide Professional Grade Disease Killer for Home Lawns. And the um, active ingredient in it is Heritage or Zoxostrobin, which has been the long time um, um, fungicide that golf courses and commercial applicators use. But it's been very cost prohibitive for homeowners. They've not really had a lot of. Um, of things to use, and most of the time we just tell our homeowners, try not to fertilize so late in the spring, and just um, just grin and bear it now, and um, reseed in the fall. But this Maxide, um, it's a it's a product that's put out by Syngenta. It is gonna it is in a bag. It's a granular. It's less than twenty dollars a bag for five thousand square foot coverage. It does last for twenty eight days. You put it on as a granular, then you water it in. And um, I've had a couple of people that are have been using it and and seem to think that it's helping. Um, it actually is curative and preventive both. It lasts for 28 days. And I just think that that's, it's the first thing that a homeowner has really been able to go out and buy himself and get out there and use. So I feel really good about it. Um, the, one, the one thing that I have seen so far is that it's a very fine granular. And they give you settings for you um, fertilizer spreader on the back of the bag. But I still find that these settings let it get out too quickly. And so I have just been telling folks, set your spreader to the to the setting that that is the smallest openings, and um, just take your 5,000 square feet and and you know work it out from there. But use the smallest setting until you can see how quickly it leaves the spreader because um, the settings that they have on the bag have seemed to um, let it get all out too quickly. So that's been the only downside I've seen so far. And of course, this summer has been so hot and humid that. It's out there, and and you don't know how well these folks are getting it spread. But but right now, I'm encouraged um, by what I've seen. So that's sort of my insight. You, um, the max sign I, I saw at our local hardware was I think 17 something for 5,000 square feet. So that's a whole lot better than the heritage has been in the past. Anybody have any questions for me? Okay, thanks very much, Donna. I appreciate your your making the time to to share that with us. Anytime, Lucy. Our our guest lecturer today is Will Hooker. Will is a landscape architect and a professor here in the horticulture department at, at North Carolina State University. He's won about every award there is to win, and has a strong following of of passionate people who are making the world a better place. So uh, let me turn it over to, to Will. And before I do, though, let me just tell you real quick that um, Will has hundreds of slides to show you today. He has lots and lots of, of, of images to dazzle you with. And so he's going to race through and show you lots and lots of things. And has asked that rather than asking questions as we go along, if you'll type your questions in the chat as we go, he will address questions at the end. So with no further ado, here's Will. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. I appreciate it a lot. Um, oops. Where did you go? Okay. Um, I've got to go up here. Oh, sorry, folks. There you go. Oh, gosh. 
Um, okay, and I'm going to need that. So we're um, experiencing a little technical <laughs> learning curve here. I'm going to talk about permaculture. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do uh, uh, a few things. I'm going to define it. For those of you who have not heard about it, I'm going to talk about the founders very briefly, explain why it's important now, and then do a quick overview of the ethics and principles of permaculture, how to think about permaculture. And then what I want to show most of all is an example of uh, permaculture uh, principles put into action. And that's going to be at my home garden. So I'm going to begin um, right away. Okay. Okay, um, the definition of permaculture, as you see here, is a combination of two um, words, permanent and culture, or permanent agriculture, really. And it's the design and maintenance of an ecosystem that, in effect, replicates a natural ecosystem. That's what we're trying to do here. The difference here is that we're focusing on the integration of the needs of the natural ecosystems or the, or the conscious consciously designed ecosystem and people for food, shelter, etc. Okay. Um, the person that started this is a gentleman by the name of David Holmgren, who was a sophomore in college in the um, mid 70s, and he wrote a uh, term paper talking about how he thought people should be living. Next. The uh, gentleman, one of the professors at his university was Bill uh, Mollison, and Bill Mollison saw that and he said, this is what we have to do, and he himself was an ecologist. And so he teamed with David and they wrote the book Permaculture One that came out in 1978. Now, Bill Mollison is given the credit for this. I, I say this because I, he's, he's a, a rascally fellow, but he, um, is a genius in terms of spreading the word. He does not like universities. In fact, he would be upset if he knew I was teaching. Uh, but, but that's beside the point. What he did is he taught uh, 12, 15 people initially, and then he taught them to be teachers. And they went out and spread. And their students went out and spread. And now there are millions and millions of permaculture teachers around the world. Through this grassroots, down and dirty, dirty fingernail style of teaching. And for that, I give him a great deal of credit. Next. Uh, so why is sustainability important now? That's the question. Next. Oh gosh, this come up comes on differently. Okay, um, we have environmental, social, and economic uh, problems going on. Um, under environmental, the climate change, there is a conference going on even as we speak in uh, South Korea, and one of the UN um, representatives there had a devastating kind of outlook on what's happening relative to global warming. We know this is happening, and he was very concerned about what it's going to mean relative to security, safety, etc. Land degradation keeps going on. We keep losing acres to uh, development and, and all the things that go wrong with it. The next one, the, the resource depletion relative to global peak oil is a very big deal. And that's going to impact our whole way of life, including how we get our food, how we travel, etc. Certainly under social, we have family and community breakdown. Um, families are now not the biggest segment of our population. The single um, occupancy folks are. Um, Many of us are, are um, susceptible to addictive behaviors, and I'm raising my hand now. I'm not without this. Under economic and political, the national and household debt is unprecedented. Uh, we're struggling with this as we try to correct some of the problems in our systems, uh, the health care debate going on even as we speak. Um, certainly, we know robber baron capitalism and illusion deception and some of the uh, governments around the world are going to these high security, in effect, neo-fascist solutions in order to protect and maintain some of what is going on. Next. Um, the, if we look at this, we, we, at the bottom line of, of this graph is time. And if we look at the vertical graph, it's energy and resource use, population and pollution. So 
up until the beginning of the um, Industrial Revolution, basically we lived sustainably, all of us. And then once we got into some of the um, advantages or the advances we made in, in terms of understanding how to take advantage of some energy resources like oil, of course, then we had more ability to produce more food, to cut more trees or whatever, and therefore we were more able to increase our populations and we got the industrial ascent that you see. We're now right at the top of that curve, which is, is the postmodern cultural uh, climax, and what we're trying to figure out is where we're going from here. Um, there are a couple of different ways of going. One is the techno-fantasy, and that is uh, the people that tell us, including our last president, that we're just going to invent our way out of this. Well, it's not so. We're not going to be able to come up with enough energy, enough food, etc., to handle what's happening with the burgeoning population. I'm guilty of the next fantasy, the green tech stability, and that is if I can only be a better person, if I can only turn the water off when I brush my teeth, or if, you know, all the things that we all know if I'll ride my bike a couple days a week instead of uh, driving, well, that's not going to work either. What we're dealing with is, in effect, the beginning of a paradigm shift which is a lower energy paradigm, and we're all going to have to change. Now, we can use the creative descent, one, of, one version of which is permaculture, or we can you know, opt for the Atlantean version, which none of us really want. So what we're going to try to do is deal with a more creative descent into the, um, a, a rational relationship with our energy and resources. Okay, next. John Lyle, who taught at Cal Poly Pomona, working at about the same time as David Holmgren and Bill Mollison, came up with several different models. And he was saying that if you look here, this becomes the city, this area becomes the area that supports the city, and this is the natural landscape. And, and well, let me just interject for a second. Can you, did you guys see where the arrow was pointing? No. Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh. Okay. So here. Okay. This is this is kind of a city area where people live. The dotted um, a surround is is the land necessary to support that city. In the squiggly dark area is is the natural area left. Now this worked during pre-industrial times. Next. Okay. Um, and and what we've evolved is we've evolved this linear system, and that is we get the sources, the, the forest, uh, the metals from, from mining, etc. We change them through some sort of throughput, that is we create cars, we create homes, and then at the end of that, cash for clunkers, we've got a bunch of cars we've got to do something with. Where are we going to put them? We're going to put them in a landfill. Well, for the longest time, we were worried we were running out of sources. Now we're worried we're running out of sinks. The air, the water is polluted, the land, uh, we're struggling what we do with landfills. Next. So basically what we so have is a system that looks like this now, where the cross-hatched area is the population. If you look at um, the British Isles, for instance, London alone, if you just took London and the 7 million people living there, it would take all the rest of the land area in the British Isles to support just London by itself, let alone the rest of the people in that, in that area. So we've got to change how we're operating our various systems in support of, of the human population. Next. Um, and as you can see, as Lewis and New Yorker said, I'm afraid you have humans. Next. Um, this is John Lyle's vision of what we should do, and I think it's a good vision relative to permaculture, and that is we should all take greater responsibility for meeting those basic needs that we each have within our own sphere of influence, and that's essentially what this symbolic uh, uh, drawing of John Lyle's is. Next. Okay, this is perhaps the most important image I'm going to share with you today, and, and this is again from John Lyle. 
what it shows you is that where you have your source and where you're taking your source material and, and using it in ways that add to all of our, our uh, betterment, you're working in cyclical systems or you're working in systems. So you take a source, you use it, you put it back as the foundation for another system. And we'll talk about this further as we go. Next. Okay, the ethics of permaculture are fairly straightforward. Care for the earth. We know we have to do this. We've treated the earth as an inanimate object, and we know that's not working anymore. Certainly care for the people. How do we care for the people with some of the pressures coming at us? That's the question we'll talk about today. The third one I like, and that is share the surplus. It's not about simply making money. It's about sharing because we're all in this together, really. So produce, and as well as produce, time and energy. Next. These are the ten principles that Bill Mollison has in his book, Introduction to Permaculture. Um, David Holmgren has written a book, uh, Permaculture Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability, that has 12, and he's, he's based it on 25 years of work in this. Um, different people use different principles. I'm going to use Mollison's today, and I'm going to briefly um, illustrate each one of these. And, and you can write them as you go if you want, because I'll be, going, I'll be taking on each one. So let's go to that first one. The first one is relative location. And this deals with getting one system in the proper adjacency with a second system. And in this, you set up the relationship. So the needs of one element fill the yields of another. Now, what you see uh, is in the bottom right-hand corner, Joe Palacier, um, a gentleman who I considered to be the best permaculturist in the world. And I did, by the way, travel around the globe with my wife and son um, uh, 10 years ago visiting permaculture places. So Joe is just, or was, he recently died, he was just north of Auckland in New Zealand. And the garden he's working in is his own one garden, the image just above him. To the left is the, is the, the point I want to make. Joe has, if you can see in the lower right hand corner, he has a dovecote and he understands how birds operate. And that is, when they come home, they first perch. And you see that perch in the left hand image. They'll come and they'll sit there, they'll look around, make sure everything's safe before they go back to their, to their shelter. And in addition, they will make a nitrogen deposit. So what Joe has done is he set up this post and he moves it around the garden depending on where he needs his fertilizer. I showed this to my wife and she said, not in my greens garden. <laughs> Next. <laughs> um, each element performs many functions. This is the home of Charlie Heddington in Greensboro. He's a permaculture designer and teacher. And the side of the house we're seeing is the south side of his house. And he's put up plants to cool it. So he's helping to mitigate the heat in the summer. Well, on the very right-hand side by his porch, he's got kiwi. The next thing, and over to the right, the kiwi. Then he's got a pear next to that. A pear is a good urban tree because it grows kind of columnar and close. And then behind that, he's got lab labs and, and grapes and stuff. And so what he's doing is he's got cooling, which was his main agenda item here, but he's also got food, he's got animal habitat, he's got blooms. It's a nice system he's got going. Next. Another kind of linked um, principle is each important function is supported by many elements. Now, redundancy is one of those attributes that doesn't get talked about enough, and it's really a very important attribute in terms of food, water, etc. You can see in the right the water tank that um, we put in our house, and my wife got so excited, I put it in because I wanted to have water to irrigate the garden. My wife got so excited because she had lived in Africa where water was a precious commodity, and she wanted to have water for instance, when a hurricane hit, like Fran hit, and took her water out for a week. So this becomes backup. It's redundancy. Next. Efficient energy planning is really talking about how you use your or your human energy efficiency efficiently. In the image from Mollison's book, 
is basically a bullseye, and this is one of the things a lot of people look at. And what this is about is where you see the home in the middle, that's zone zero. And as you work on your landscape and take care of your needs, you put the things you're going to have to put the most energy into the closest, like the zone one garden around that pond just below. And then as you go out, the zones get less and less of your of your labor. Let's see how that works out. Next. Uh, you can see here the center of the activity. It could be the house, could be the village. Zone 1 is the most controlled and intensively used. Certainly the clothesline, the wood storage, greenhouse, compost, your, zone, your, your kitchen garden basically where you're going to take most of the food that is uh, immediate off. Zone 2 is still intensively managed. Now I'll put the chickens between Zone 1 and Zone 2. Here you have orchards, ponds, small fruits, etc. Next. Zone 3 is unpruned, unmulched. You can on occasion put water there, but it's where you have your larger animals if you have more, your nut trees, birds, etc. Zone 4, you go to harvest. And that might be wild and timber products, wildlife, could be hardy foods like some of the nuts that grow in the wild around here. Zone 5 is where you don't do anything. You leave this alone. You go there to learn. Next. So in, in, in our example, when my wife and I were getting together, we were renting a house close to the university. And you can see in the image to the left, we mowed where we were going to keep the lawn and had that kind of perimeter bed around it. And where my wife is working on the left there, if you look at the upper right hand image, where the bamboo is, is where she was working. And that's where we had our production garden. We built a path from the front stoop, if you see in the left hand image, here. And, and it kind of went from here out and to there. And then we walked up and walked to the university. So she and I each walked past the garden on the right each day twice. And we had some of the most productive stuff going on there. Similarly, in the lower right-hand image, that's right off our back kitchen. And it was hot and bright there. And that's where we put our kitchen herbs for cooking. So that it was, if we were, had a pot going, it was very quick. It wasn't a lot of expenditure of energy. Next. OK. Um, use biological resources. Certainly, we know um, the birds that we'll put out to control insects in the lower left. And the lower right is, uh, in the blue coat, is Graham. Alexander, who uh, wrote Permaculture Garden, and that's his chicken tractor. And they put that in, and they go along the beds in the garden. And the chickens will dig up and take care of the pests and make deposits, etc. In the upper right-hand corner is a, is a chicken known as Donna King, because of the crazy hairdo, who lived at <laughs> Earth Haven. And she used to hang out around the outdoor dining area. So any food that dropped, Donna would take care of. And then it wasn't an ant problem coming around. Next. Um, energy cycling, this is a big one. Um, and it's, it's one of those basic principles of the universe. Um, you use the energy coming in. And I like the term wild energy for sun and wind and water. I, I took my permaculture fundamentals course at the farm in Tennessee. And we started this project. You see the shower in the background. And the water would be heated by that solar heater. And then it would drop. And we put down a tarp under that structure, filled it with gravel, and drew. Uh, and, and then we dug the swale here and around down to this pond. We threw the dirt from the swale by the posts over to the sun side or to the south. And then as the water comes from the shower, first it cleans us. Then it goes along the swale and it irrigates the garden plants. And at the end, it comes into a pond where the beneficials and the frogs and the dragonflies and the, and the toads and stuff can live to help in controlling any pests in the garden. Thanks. Small scale intensive systems. Uh, this is, again, an image of Charlie Hennington's place in Greensboro and his neighbor in the foreground. It doesn't have much going. Charlie's got lots going, and has even got a lot of um, uh, plants that he put in the planting strip that he was going to use. Um, 
the thing about this is the most efficient size or the most productive size of agriculture land that we can have is a piece of land on the order of a quarter to an acre in size. That's it. Now, uh, the, the agriculture uh, uh, community has said, get bigger, get out. But, but they're doing it with these big machines. And it's not as efficient or productive as the smaller acreages. Next. Um, one of the things that we have to do as permaculturists is we have to look at where we are in succession and evolution. If you look at the upper left-hand corner, this is essentially a, a landscape that might have occurred after a devastation like Katrina or one of those things hitting in the lower left is a climax forest. And what we do as permaculturists is we pick the useful plants from each of those and we combine them. The gentleman in the cardigan sweater to the right is Robert Hart who wrote the book Forest Gardening and this is his garden in England. And what he does is he puts in fruit trees, and fruit trees are not long alive. They're, they will live long, but they're really productive for about 10 to 15 years. Then he will take it out. Where he takes it out, there's a big opening in the sky where the sun is, and then he will put in his annuals, his tomatoes, his squash or whatever, that will produce within the sun. This is a method he discovered by traveling around the world and looking at the gardens of the aboriginal cultures. They're not ordered, they're not in rows, they're not tidy, but they're very, very productive. Next. Diversity. Uh, these are Bill Mollison's quotes. Um, basically, what Bill Mollison and David Holmgren say is that you want to do plants in combination. And the left-hand image has some, and this is Harvey Harmon's farm in Bear Creek. It has some um, cucumbers going up in the middle. To the right-hand side or sun side is where uh, he's growing his basil. And on the back side, he's doing some summer celery. And, and it's good. He's using the plants in combination, mainly with the sun. He also, and I got this from Harvey, is of the opinion that in the temperate zones, we are really better with a plant-animal combination. And I illustrate this with a tall grass prairie in Oklahoma. At one time, the buffalo were wiped out, and the tall grass prairie wasn't doing good. They have uh, reintroduced um, the buffalo, and I was trying to catch the buffalo as he was making a nitrogen deposit, and I didn't quite do it. I don't know if we've got Photoshop. Hit it, hit it Lucy. Hit it one time and see what happens. Now I'll go up here. Yeah, okay. Okay, hit it again. That's enough of that. Um, the last one is edge effects. And a lot of times when we go for the neat and tidy, we eliminate where the most biodiversity occurs. And that's at the edge of two separate ecologies, be it waterland, forest field, or even in the case of Raleigh, the coastal plain and the Piedmont. Every major city in the entire world has to have two ecologies in order to survive. And if you think about cities that are along the coast, certainly they have the ocean ecology and they have the land ecology. That's where you bring together the resources necessary to support the numbers of people in the city. Next. Okay, so if you look at this, this is from um, David Holmgren's book. It's his permaculture flower. And, and we're not going to deal with all seven of the petals. We're going to deal with uh, land, nature stewardship, built environment, tools, and technology today. Next. Um, the physical systems, and this is basically how I teach my course, which is available, by the way, distance ed. Some of you have probably taken that, but it's available if you'd like to. Um, I teach the five main physical systems and then how to apply the principles within these. Shelter in the built environment, food, energy, material resources, and water. Next. And I'm going to illustrate these at our place, 610 Kirby. Next. We bought this house about 15 years ago, and we had a couple of criteria. One, I wanted to be within walking distance of the university. And for me, we were about 3 quarters of a mile away. I wanted to be a little bit further because I wanted a little more distance to walk. Um, so it's about a mile and a half. 
two, I wanted it to be small. This is a thousand square foot home because I think in the future as resources are scarcer and more expensive, we're going to be building smaller and smaller homes. So I wanted to understand and experience what it was like to live in that and deal with privacy versus um, the connection to community. Uh, the last thing I wanted is, well, two other things. I wanted it to be south facing. You see the real good sun here. And I wanted it to be under $100,000 so my wife and I could, with one, um, with one income, be able to afford the mortgage no matter what happened. And we got it. So next. Um, we had traveled around the world about five years after that, and when we got back, we decided to really put our energy and effort into creating this permaculture garden. So we needed a new roof, and rather than do an, a less expensive roof, we put on a metal roof because we wanted to be able to have cleaner water when it dropped. Next. Um, the other thing, our son, when we got back from around the world, was just two and a half years old, and he was running around, so we wanted a little protection between him and the street. So rather than just build a straightforward fence, I decided to build a Belgian fence. This is made of cedar and um, and bamboo. Next, and you can see what I did is I plant. I got I got from Lee Calhoun in Pittsburgh some of the old-fashioned heritage apples. I planted them about 30 inches on center, and you can see I'm espaliering them up the bamboo, and you can see where they come together. They, uh, they join, and they will eventually grow together. So eventually, I will have a freestanding fence. I can take down the cedar, take down the bamboo next, and I will have a productive uh, uh, living fence that's giving me apples or some other fruit. Next. I say some other fruit because I'm not happy with the apples. I may change it out to an oriental persimmon. <laughs> Um, back to that same shot before, and again, it, the sun doesn't show here, but what I want to do is we're trying to retrofit the house, and I want to take in some passive solar energy so the space to the left of the window gets very good sun next. And what we're going to do is put in a trom wall or a solar air dryer. So basically, as you can see in the sketch, the cool air comes in from the lower part of the house. As it goes out between the glazing and a black wall, it heats, goes in, and will warm, warm the at least that one room. Uh, typically, and next, I'll show you. Um, you can see trauma on the left that's uh, attached to the wall. That will be something like I'll have, and the one is a portable. The, the one under the window is portable and can be put on or not. On the web where they're available, I see that they will heat about 600 square feet. So I've only got a thousand square foot home. Next. Um, we did put on some uh, solar water heaters uh, this past October. Next. And basically, what they do is uh, they drop the glycosine down into this heat exchange tank, and uh, then it goes over to the big 80-gallon uh, tank and then into our existing 40-gallon tank. So we're heating all our water. should pay for itself in about seven years, and we'll have free hot water after that. Oh, sorry. Back one. Yeah. Back. Yeah. This is, a big, <laughs> this is a big one. Relative to energy, um, putting in a clothesline is the absolute best thing you can do. Bill Mollison, in 1983, when he was re uh, researching his second book, uh, The Design Manual for Permaculture, he looked around the U.S. for a utility, a common utility, that matched in need the exact output of all the nuclear power plants in the country. And as you can see, it was clothes drying. And so the, me the message here is, if we all just dried our clothes, solar clothes dryers, we could turn the switches off on those on those machines. And that's just, they're scary to me. Okay, next. Okay, we're going to quickly go through the backyard. This is what it uh, was when we got it. Black cherry on the left, uh, kind of a plum tree to the upper right that was there, and then that old shed with asphalt shingles. Next. Um, we put in, we found the sunniest spot. You can see where there's mulch. Uh, it doesn't show it with, with the sun at this time, but that was the sunniest spot in our backyard. So we put down the cardboard we watered, put down the, the uh, manure, and then layered on top of that um, uh, leaves and straw and manure, etc., and let it set over the winter so it was ready to go to the next spring. Next. Um, 
We did put the hot tub that my wife gave me for my 50th birthday above the garden so we could siphon it down into the garden if we had to. Next. And then I just uh, took some bamboo. Bamboo's everywhere. I made a little enclosure that would uh, enclose that and it worked quite nicely. I've got that. Uh, I've got the bamboo between the lawn area and, and the hot tub so my son wouldn't get burned when he was running around. Next. Um, in the back, you see the 4 by 4 standing. My wife wanted chickens, and she was getting those. I said, wait a minute, Gina, wait a minute. We, I don't want to have that awful stuff all, all the, off those 4 by 4s in our landscape. So I asked her to return those, and next. And what she did is she was digging around in the backyard, and she discovered an area where there was an old brick path under the lawn. And so I said, ooh, perfect. Dig that out, and then I went to a local... Um, uh, man who sells cedar posts, bought cedar posts, she built a fire and we charred the post because charcoal is neutral and bugs are not attracted to it. So basically we charred everything we were building with. Next. And I built the chicken coop. Now you can see I've got welded wire and hardware cloth over the hole. Next. And basically what this is is a system. In other words, the chickens need shade. They, they need shade more than they need heat in the winter. They need cool in the summer. Um, it also is a grape arbor, so we have grapes. The other thing it is, is gr the grape plant is uh, an attractor plant for Japanese beetles. So when the Japanese beetles are in, in the, in the June area of the year, when we go down to let the chickens out at the beginning of the day, we'll shake the whole arbor. Japanese beetles drop as a defensive mechanism, and as you can guess, chickens love Japanese beetles. So it's a Japanese beetle trap. Next. Chickens are good for taking care of weeds. Next. Um, we, and when we have a broody hen, we'll sometimes put a fertile egg we get from another place under and let her raise it next. And this becomes um, a wonderful uh, learning experience for my son Eli and his bud Kynir. Next. We also get food. Uh, uh, and we chose the chicken breeds for the color of the eggs they laid. So we get blue, green, white, and all kinds of uh, uh, colors of brown and tan. Next. We put our energy after getting back from our around the world trip into our garden because we both like to garden, my wife and I next. And basically we can we can uh, produce we produce about twenty percent of the food that we eat now. One of our, our best crops is greens. My wife loves to grow greens and we have fresh greens from the garden daily from late September through mid June. Next. Um, and, and the garden is just as productive as it can be. Next. Just some of the images. Next. Um, this is the okay. line kind of, I love. Next. Uh, peaches this year were wonderful. Next. Uh, we got our first crop of cherries. I made a cherry pie this year. Next. Uh, plums come on from the methylly plum, one of the best because it blooms later. It doesn't get the fluky early bloom. Next. Um, this year I got my first crop of elderberries. And this is this is a plant that pay attention. This is a plant that will save your life. The elderberry blocks a viral transfer through a cell wall. So the H1N1 virus that they're making all this noise about is coming at us with three elderberry plants. I probably put up a dozen different jars of elderberry syrup, and even now my wife and son and I are taking a half a teaspoon of elderberry jelly every morning in preparation to protect ourselves. Next. Um, we also had a screen and, and the maypop or the passion flower on our back deck and it turns out next that this will produce a fruit on occasion. Ours is in the shade and the fruit is not very uh, juicy or sweet um, but it's, it's still a nice screen. Next. Uh, I even grew bananas one year and got a bunch of bananas here. Bananas like nitrogen and water. I put it in a swale in the chicken coop. So you got the combination of both of them. We didn't have long enough days to get a, a, an edible fruit, but I was real proud of that bunch. Next. Uh, putting the stuff away, obviously we freeze some. Next. We uh, we do like to dry the figs. Anything dried increases the, the sugar content and the figs are just great. Next. Uh, my wife got into making jelly, even wanted a blue ribbon at the fair. Next. Um, and I'm into making pies now. This is from our peach crop this year, uh, the, first, the first we had going. Next. Um, obviously, with a very hot um, um, attic, we can 
We can dry herbs up there next. One of our favorites to make is pesto. We make this and we have pesto year round. Uh, just put, put it in little ice trays and freeze it, put it in the freezer next. Um, one of the things that we're preserving probably most of all is the knowledge of how to do all of this. And you can see from the pride on our pumpkin farmer how much fun that is. Next, uh, I, we do do shiitake mushrooms. Next, and we get a good crop yearly on this. I run workshops with my students and uh, I get some logs out of it and we eat very well and dry what we don't eat. So they, they work good in soups. Next. Um, I got upset several years ago as we were running out of room. And I said, well, okay, let's go vertical. So we started growing up the back of the shed. Next, we had to the left under the gazing ball, bean teepee, and to the right, the blue boxes. I was doing one of those stacked potato boxes. Next. And I, I got uh, real good at it. So I, I thought I, in terms of putting some space, uh, they'd come out. But both of the harvest I had, the two years I tried, were next this. My goodness, what a pathetic harvest. Well, I was a little bit overweight at the time anyway, so I went on a low-carb diet and I said, enough of those potatoes next. Now my wife, she's the head gardener and she's very creative, so next. She said, I know what to do with those boxes and she made them into lettuce boxes next. Um, and we get this kind of production next. One of the boxes uh, that I made uh, was from a lumber milled from a tree taken down in the neighborhood. And and we've tried the three sisters in here. I've got some potatoes going again. I'm going to try to grow them normally this time. Next. Uh, my neighbor took down two trees. They were dropping limbs through his roof and he got sick of it so he took them down. Next. He ricked that lumber up. Next. And he made it into a screen porch at the back of his house. So we can do urban forestry. It's possible. Next. Um, I believe and there's a cedar tree at the back of our yard and um, I'm, I'm getting so high I can hardly get to it so I'm starting to leave steps but here I am cutting a limb off next and then I take that I make that into the frame next and I'm building gates for the garden and around next. Uh, one of the things and here I'm having more fun with it here you can see I'm starting to get more artsy with it next. On the back side I'm using a counterweight system. It's got a, you can see a window sash below the bottle and the bottle, an old wine bottle with blue dye in it. Next. Um, but we, when we traveled around the world we did, did all our purchasing for all the family and friends in Bali and we sent it all back in this big box and I said well let's have a bonfire and I said no I'm making a playhouse for my Sony. And I got upset. I said, no, I don't want more trash in the yard. She said, let me just do it. So she did it. And it was so beautiful. I said, Gina, you need to put a, a roof on that. She said, no, Mr. Permaculture. <laughs> you need to put a roof on it. So I challenged myself to do it without buying anything. So I just used scraps and landscape stuff around the yard next. And um, got it together, found some grass, and, and put that on top. So this became the playhouse next. And I had put in a couple black-eyed Susans and they grew like crazy. And at the end of the year when the grass got too high next, I would just lift my son up there with a pair of scissors and he would cut the grass. So this worked very well for a while. Next. Um, one of the things we do in our home is also we generate medicinals and, and we can see it. I'm going to have to stop soon. Quick. Um, you can see the echinacea below go next. We do mullen um, and next. And what we do is just pick the blooms next and put those in 100 proof vodka and tincture it for a while, take the blooms out. And then, uh, yeah, I, and, and it's good. My wife has a bronchial thing and this works a couple drops a day. Next, we've also discovered that the passiflower leaves made into a tea will are a relaxant. And my son gets a little anxious and worried at night and this helps him sleep. Next. So the plants, very quickly, um, we have 54 cultivars of fruits, 81 uh, plants, and that's trees, shrubs, vines. 34 cultivars, herbs, medicinals, you see attractors for beneficials and pollinators, veggies certainly, useful plants like the red cedar that I can make gates with. Next. Uh, water quickly, I'm just going to run through this. This is a tank I got. Let's go ahead next. Uh, put some a concrete block to have calcium which attracts heavy metals. Next and we put it up on a pier next 
And this is the first rain that actually occurred half an hour after I finished it. You can see it's translucent, and that, if, if the sun gets in, there will be algae next. So what happened is I painted it. We have a real good paint for our home. I painted it white. That didn't work. Next, we're putting plants around it. But um, next. On our chicken coop, what we did is we captured water off the roof, put it in the tank, and you can see it was all painted white to match the house. Next, my daughter, a couple years ago, painted the chicken coop for Father's Day, and she decorated it, and I said, that's a good color, so I put green on the tank. So this year, next, I decided next that the white tank needed to be green, so I painted green over that, and next, and then I put the white back, and you can see I have a first wash um, a, a PVC pipe down. In other words, the water fills in here and then before it comes over and drops. Next. Okay, this is just pond stuff. Let's just run through these. Next. Next. Yeah. My son used to catch these every day and they, they got so they jumped in his, his net before we go. Next. Uh, next. Just some of the frog photos. Next. Uh, we, this became a hangout in the neighborhood next. And so we built a patio of stone we got from a local and brick we got from a local company. Keep going. Next. It was hot. Next. So we built a gazebo. I experimented with bamboo. Next. And we put up, yeah, and it, uh, the fall blooming clematis came. You can see the, the, um, the banana in the background there. Next. As I got older, I got um, tired of rebuilding bamboo gazebos, so I went back to my local um, cedar source, got some cedars, I put this up next. Wanted to make an oven. We used clay from the neighbors to make a cob oven that we're going to uh, bake pizzas in next. And this is one of my favorites. I, I used to like to drink Harvey Bristol. Bristol's cream at, at Christmas, and I love that blue bottle. So I started collecting them, and finally I figured out next what to do with them. They're edging for our garden, so that, that's good. Next, uh, play. I built this structure so my son, we, we don't have trees, so he could have upper body strength. Next, he got into the zip line with that upper body strength. Next, and then some of the things like the fennel. Next, we put in just so he can next um, have fun interacting with the insects. Next. Next. And beauty is a big one. Just flow through here, Lucy. Next. Next. Lilies. Next. The one wisteria tree. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's OK. That's OK. There you go. Again. Again. Just some of the things of beauty we find. So, so the issue is, as a global culture, we are facing and what can we each do? So let's go real quickly here. Um, we can increase food security. I just heard today, yesterday on NPR, that in Great Britain they are supremely concerned about the availability of food in the future. So we have to do, more of us have to be food producers. Next, we can do it in the right of way. This is a plum tree on our street that we put in. The, the kids ride their bikes under it and pick plums as they go. Next. Uh, like in Cuba, some of the, the vacant land in our cities we can convert to food production. Next. Charlie Headington is doing this in Greensboro. This is a garden he put in with a Montessori school. And we're going to expand our school gardens and gardens at our churches. Next. Even this is in Swan and Noah. Some of you know the, the dorm at the, the eco dorm at Warren Wilson and food production everywhere in that landscape. Next. Uh, we can creatively use recycled materials, cob buildings um, in, the, in the, the one at the middle. This is a recycled uh, scotch uh, bin in, in Findhorn. Okay, next. Um, quickly, TS Designs in Burlington, we can, we can employ sustainable principles of commercial settings. Let's go. He's got the uh, retail biodiesel. He's got a solar tracker. Next, uh, wind turbine. Next, uh, has a biodiesel co-op. Oh, That's okay. Let's hold it. That's okay. Uh, the biodiesel co-op next. And what they do, you need hot water to make biodiesel. And so they get their the water heated by a compost pile around a big tank. Next, they they capture the condensate from the air conditioning and flush their toilets. Next. And they have a CSA on site for the employees of this. Next. 
uh, one of the things that's a big deal with me living in Raleigh is is preserving open space. This is Dorothea Dix. One of the biggest needs in the future, 50, 100 years down the with the population exploding, is square footage relief from being in these tight uh, residential settings. So we're going to need open space. <laughs> OK, so next, we can either continue on our way and live in a very neat and tidy graveyard next, or we can start to save the world and the starts at our doorstep. Paradise for me is this. I've lived here, but paradise for me is also this next, my home next. OK, uh, just some of my favorite references, if any of you are interested. Uh, I will say the Gaius Garden at the top, the Home Scale Permaculture Second Edition, the images on the front of that book uh, to the right are from my garden. They called up and said, can you send us some? So obviously, that's why that's number one on my list. OK, we have time for one or two questions. Well, you had one question that was, um, what percentage of the sheet compost should be broken down by spring planting? Um, I don't know the specific answer to that. I do know that what we did, it had broken almost all the way down, and we were able to just go in. Now, at the time, I was double digging. So I just went in, double dug, and put it. We had a little bit of the compost left as kind of a coverage, and we just planted through it. It was great. Another one? Uh, another question that came through is whether the slides were going to be available online. And Will has offered to make these available to horticulture agents. So yes, I'll put them up. Yes. Later. Right. Other questions? You guys can turn your mics on and ask questions. Sorry I ran so long. See anything there? There's stunned silence. <laughs> Do any of you have any questions about permaculture while we've got um, Will here to answer questions? We have a couple of minutes that he can take some questions. Can Ovations from the crowd. Pop it on the side. Okay, somebody's got their hand raised, but there's such a long list of folks I don't see who it is. So feel free to go ahead and ask your questions. How many people can be sustained on a quarter acre? Oh gosh, that's a, a really good question. Um, I went to David Holmgren's place, and he was on um, two and a half acres, and he was living 95% on his land alone with himself, his wife, and two kids. Um, I'm looking on, and I have less than a fifth of an acre, and we do about a fifth of our food supply. I would like, and I can't be sustained there completely. I would like to get my production. My goal is 50. If I make 30, I'm going to be real pleased with that. I think we can do the bulk of our greens, and as our fruit trees mature and we figure out, we become better skilled at putting food by. I think we will handle almost all of our our fruit. So I'm pretty happy with that. And of course, we do all the veggies and all that sort of stuff. So I really don't know the answer to that. Uh, different people, John Chauvin says there's lots and lots you can do. Um, I'm probably not a good enough gardener to maximize it because I got to work like most of us. <laughs> okay. How many citizens in Raleigh have at least a quarter acre? I don't know the answer to that. I would guess the bulk of the homeowners in Raleigh have a quarter of an acre. Um, and, and you know, I, I've read on, on the line some of the quotes of how much food we could produce if we only converted all of our front lawns to gardens. And it's just phenomenal. And in fact, with peak oil coming, which means we've, we've got the easiest oil there is to get the rest. The other half is going to be very difficult and translate very expensive. That means, as, as uh, some people say, the 3,000 mile Caesar salad is no longer going to be available. We're not going to be able to afford it. So the local food grown and, and handled through farmers markets are going to compete very well with some of this mass produced food that we're now taking for granted from California or Florida. Okay. Well, how do you keep your passiflora up if they come in like kudzu? Boy, is that a good question. I, I just, we cut, 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 and I have to say, this shocked me. I went underneath our house in the crawl space, and it's a big, tall crawl space where you saw the, um, the hot water heater, 
and the passiflora had grown under our foundation and come up in it. Um, I say to people, don't put this sucker in because it is so outrageous in terms of its aggressiveness. So good question. Thank you. How much time do you spend working in the garden each day? Um, each day is really not as relevant. Lately I've been spending more because we've got a, a garden writers tour coming up in a month or so. But and and I think between my wife and I, if if we average it out over the course of a year, we probably spend with both of us about ten hours a week in the garden. Now the average in England is, and England is, is the country of gardeners, they spend about 10 hours a week in their garden. The average in the United States is less than a half an hour, and that's probably given mostly to mowing the lawn. <laughs> um, it, takes, it takes some time, and as um, Bill Mollison says, some of us are gardeners, others of us are not. So what we have to do is put our passion and our energy to what we are good at. And, and as David Holmgren was saying, unlike the 70s when self-sufficiency was, was the mode, what we're dealing with now is community interdependence. In other words, we have to depend on those in the, in the circles around us. So we're going to make it with our friends, with our family, with our community. We're not going to make it alone. So some of us will do one thing, some of us, of us will do another. Well, I think part of, of what you're talking about, too, Will, is the importance of, of giving thought to the design up front right, so right. that it's not high maintenance, right, that it's designed right, to, to, right. to work well so that you don't have to put as much time and energy into right, managing it. Right. Just enjoying it. The permaculture statement is once you get it going, Mollison says you, you put in 30 hours of, of work and then it's done and it takes care of itself. For the, yeah, right. <laughs> I don't believe that for a minute. But you can cut it back. Now, the thing that I'm trying to do and, and is why I had the slides on beauty in there a lot of the permaculture places I saw are just ugly as sin. And I'm trying to introduce a way of making them more beautiful, more aesthetically acceptable, and that might take a little more work. So, you know, five, five hours a week, a year-round, is not a bad input in a garden. One more quick question. Was, um, do you happen to know the average amount of time spent in a Japanese home garden? I have no idea. <laughs> and there was no second on you. Would you would you advocate removing a lot of trees to create sunny areas for growing? Um, um, I definitely if you if you want to have food production, um, you definitely have to have sun. You need minimum six hours of sun a day to get good production, good sugar, um, carbohydrates, and. If you're on the, where we are, East Coast, basically we live in a forest that has just been cleaned. And so my sense is I am not, I'm a tree hugger, but I am not adverse to taking trees out in order to get sun, in order for us to produce the food we need to live. You know, what's the alternative? Are you going to eat squirrels? I just don't, I don't know how to eat squirrels. <laughs> but yes, you will have to take it out, and I get a lot of questions on that. But it's just, as Lucy was saying, have a good design in mind. Figure where you can take the least out and maintain shade and cooling for your home setting as best you can, as well as sun for production. We've got a family discussion going on over here about chickens. Do you see any negatives to having chickens? Um, I can't see any negatives to having chickens because I didn't say this, but what we do is we scatter straw in their pen and around the yard, especially when it's wet, and then they will go through, take the seeds out, and make a deposit, and, and we throw that in the compost pile over the fence in the garden and use that to fertilize their garden. I can't see a thing that is negative about having chickens. The only thing you have to know, un unless it's designed extremely well, is you have to take you have to attend to the chickens twice a day. And so, if you go off on vacation, you have to have someone there to attend to them twice a day. So it's a commitment to their security, and it's mainly security that's a big deal. Some people have totally enclosed setups in a small urban setting where they don't have to do that. But I would rather give the chickens a bigger run and have to go down, let them out in the morning, uh, feed them the compost from our, our kitchen scraps, and then close them up at night so the predators can't get to them. But 
you know, we don't have roosters. That can wake you up. And it's not legal here in Raleigh, but uh, they're just a boon. And I say get them. What about bees? I would like to have bees. We tried to start. Um, I'm, I'm, my wife and I want to have a hive. I think it would improve our production. We went to some meetings and just couldn't get in the class this year. Next year we will. What I'm doing now is adding more native plants to kind of follow Debbie Roos's avocation for the native pollinators. And, and that's, that's what I want to do at the very least. Well, thank you so much for spending the morning with us. Oh, it's been fun. A tremendous amount thank of you all. to have shared in such a short amount of time. I know that there's uh, lots more questions that people have, and uh, they'll probably be being in touch with you. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, you got lots of clapping hands going over here. Uh, applause. <laughs> 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 Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next up, we've got uh, Mike Munster, who's going to be talking with us about current diseases of interest. Mike, it's all yours. Help to turn my microphone on there. Uh, ah, am I coming great. okay as far as yes. I Yes. Okay. I, in order so I don't get feedback here, I've got my... Uh, my speaker turned way down, so uh, if there are any questions, probably the best way to handle it is through the uh, text messaging. Very difficult presentation to follow there, both in terms of the content and the beautiful photographs, but uh, let's talk for a little bit here about current diseases of interest in North Carolina. And the first thing I want to mention is that as of last week, late blight, Phytophthora infestans, was confirmed on tomato in North Carolina. That was in Henderson County. I don't know how far it's uh, spread since then, but it will be spreading. And uh, if you missed last time or you want to review, go back to the stored, saved uh, Illuminate presentation and see the uh, little bit that I did about late blight in that session. There's also a bit in um, uh, Sue Colucci's blog on the uh, Western North Carolina vegetable blog about the late blight situation. So just to let you know that that did in fact arrive. How far it will get uh, eastward, I, I don't have a crystal ball to really know that, but uh, certainly the mountains are going to be experiencing this. And this is a disease you do not want to get behind the curve on. All right, something a little bit more mundane here and uh, close to us in the landscape bed at North Carolina State. I'm sure many of you have seen this particular symptom on English ivy. And if you see this, basically it's going to be one of two different diseases. You're looking at something that could be either bacterial leaf spot or anthracnose. And in this case, what you would do to tell the difference is take a look with your hand lens and if you've got the little black bumps within the spot that have even smaller um, tiny black CD, we call them, like bristles, then you know that what you've got is anthracnose caused by the fungus called Tartricum trichellum. Interestingly enough, this particular anthracnose is specific to the genus Hedera, the uh, English ivy, and so it will not be a threat to any other plants in your, in your landscape. There are some Colitotricums, causes of anthracnose, that are more generic and will also infect a wide range of plants. Um, yes, there is, a, I see a question here from uh, Cindy Lauderdale, there is an anthracnose on sycamore. Uh, it is a different one, uh, not even a Colitotricum species, but that is a, a definite problem on sycamores. The, uh, Anthracnose in general is a, is a group of diseases, and we do see a certain ones that are on hardwood trees, like sycamore, the famous one on dogwood in the mountains, um, maples. I think we talked about an anthracnose on maple earlier in the year. Another anthracnose I want to point out, oh wait, first let me mention that uh, if you don't see these black specks, you could have bacterial spot. Uh, but there, I'm imagining it could be a case where these just hadn't formed yet, so you still might not be able to tell which is which. But once you see these little specks in the middle of the spots, then you know that your English ivy is suffering from anthracnose. 
see that something's going on here. The slide that doesn't want to show. There it is. Here's another anthracnose, also very specific. This one, Calatotricum lindemuthianum, that only affects beans, and in this case, a lima bean, and these pretty spectacular looking spots on the pods. This particular sample that came in from Nash County did not have very much in the way of symptoms on the leaves. It was the pods that were mostly showing it, but you can also get, um, get symptoms on the pods, and it will get on the seed itself. So this can be seed transmitted. Be sure and plant clean seed when you're planting beans. Uh, resistant varieties may be available, and practice, if you've got the disease, do a three-year rotation out of beans to try and reduce the inoculum in the, in the soil and that residue, get that residue buried or, or removed so that it will not be carrying the fungus over from, from year to year. All right, staying with the vegetables, this is a sample of collards that came in last week. And uh, I put here Cherokee or Cabarrus County. Now you may be wondering, well, if I don't know the difference, or, well, actually I didn't because there were two different uh, samples of collards that came in on the very same day with the very same disease. So I'm not sure which county this particular one came from. But if we take a little bit closer look at the symptoms, let me pose the question to you. If I could get a hand here, please, Leanne, with making this into a multiple choice question. You notice at the top of your screen there, you'll have in a moment here popping up the letters A through E. So click on what you think the cause of this particular or what this particular uh, problem is. Wow, this doesn't happen very often. So far, I have not yet seen the right answer. A lot of people say fertilizer burn, and certainly we can get can get marginal burning of leaves from excess fertilizer. Oh, there we go. Brunswick County came through for us. Uh, this, in fact, is black spot caused by xanthomonas. One of the clues to that is going to be the that's not the pointer I wanted there. Excuse me. Well, the fact that it is on the margin, the bacteria getting in through the hydathodes when that gutation water is absorbed back into the leaf. Another clue, and that of course is not uh, unique to that disease, but another clue that you want to look for is the blackened veins, the blackened small veins. Now yellow's disease will cause some vascular discoloration, but not, not blackening. This, uh, again, black rod of crucifers will affect the other plants in the family caused by this particular path of, our, of the bacterium Xanthomonas campestris. This one, again, is disease, I'm sorry, is seed transmitted or can be, so make sure you get disease-free seed uh, and or hot water treated seed. And if you're planting transplants, check those carefully to make sure that you're not bringing it on your transplants. Don't handle plants when they're wet to avoid spreading it around, but um, it's, uh, even insects can spread this from plant to plant. Don't follow brassicas with brassicas, and if you have the disease, rotate out of brassicas for at least a year. It should be a fairly short rotation in this case. Once the residue has broken down, then the bacteria will not survive in the soil. This is very different from what we had with, remember, the bacterial wilt organism, Ralstonia solanaceum, that can survive for many years in the soil. This one will not do that. But of course, if you have cruciferous weeds present, then they can be a bridge and carry the disease over into the next crop. All right, let's move up to the uh, larger plants in our landscape for a minute. These are actually pictures submitted by a client as a sample from Orange County late last month. And this is one of our, um, well, you didn't, first of all, you'd see the canopy here looks uh, actually pretty decent. There's a dead limb there, but the tree basically looks good. Well, what were they concerned about then? Oh, let me, uh, I see, let me back up for just a second here. A question came through about black spot or black rot on crucifers. 
There is another disease that goes by, um, is it black spot or black leg or both, that's caused by a fungus called Foma lingam. So there are two different diseases that, uh, at least two, that have the word black in them uh, and that affect crucifers. So that, that particular one that we were showing from the samples was black spot of uh, xanthomonas. If I said uh, the other one, then I apologize. So the, uh, the tree here, this is a white oak, and the concern was this slimy exudate that was coming out of a wound on the trunk. This is a pretty typical high summer problem that we see. White oaks are often affected. In that particular case, it's usually quite low on the trunk near the ground line. It can affect other plants, however, and, uh, and it can be higher up. And does anybody know what this is? If you could take your text tool and write in that blank space there, we'll see what suggestions we get. OK, I see people using the chat box, which is fine. Uh, and everybody is, in fact, in agreement here that this is slime flux. And that is correct. We should probably call it wet wood and slime flux, because before you start seeing the outward sign of the fluxing, there is an, well, water-soaked, discolored uh, zones that appear in the wood. And what's happening here is that there are anaerobic bacteria present in the wood. They got in there through a wound at some point, uh, often in the roots, and started colonizing that wood. Uh, there's a buildup of solutes there, and also a buildup of gas, methane and carbon dioxide principally. And this creates pressure with, within the sap wood that can eventually force sap out through either cracks, such as in crotches or wounds, and uh, cause the fluxing that you see. This uh, then is attracted to a lot of times insects. There's a butterfly on this one, yellow jacket wasps, no, a number of other insects. Other fungi start moving in and, uh, and you get the change of color from a light color to a dark color and dark staining of the bark, as well as the uh, characteristic fermentative odor that, uh, that accompanies this. Oh, uh, yeah, see a comment here from Mike Walder about the uh, someone thinking that uh, that they were being disrespectful or uh, or vulgar by calling something slime flux. So uh, and, and he was serious. So he just says wet wood. I haven't personally had that problem yet. Anyway, there is really nothing that you can do about this or should do. Um, the treatment that has sometimes been done is putting a tube into the side of the tree so that it will direct the flux away from the bark and uh, not damage the cambium. That uh, is not really recommended. But the only thing you want to do is make sure your trees are in good vigor and uh, not wounded, trying to avoid wounding them, of course, and maybe take off the loose bark that could be around these sites, but that's about all you really want to do. It's not usually going to be a serious problem for the health of the tree uh, in our landscape trees if they are otherwise healthy. Now, we got a, a digital image sample just yesterday of what looks like a, a slime flux wetwood situation where the tree was uh, appeared to be more seriously damaged by it. This was an elm tree in, I think it was Richmond County. But most of the time, you're not talking about serious damage. The tree will uh, stop fluxing after a period of time and can go uh, and continue to live a normal life. While we're still with trees, let me move to another one of our very typical late summer diseases. This particular one came from Chatham County into the clinic here. Uh, not sure exactly what it was, but possibly a black oak. Uh, Charles uh, Hodges is our person who handles the landscape trees here in the clinic and did the diagnosis here. And this 
as you can see in a closer view, is a very classic symptom of bacterial scorch caused by Xylella fastidiosa. One of the signature symptoms of this particular disease is, well, one, of course, the scorch around the edge like this, but oftentimes, as you can see here and also here, that sort of two-toned edge effects on the margin of the scorched area, where you can get a darker brown or reddish line there, or, or two colors of the damage. To confirm it, we do have a fairly quick laboratory test that we do here in the clinic. A few highlights of this disease. There are quite a few host plants, and most often, in North Carolina anyway, we see this on oaks, sycamore, and grape. The white oak group will be affected, but mostly we see it on the red oak group, such as uh, red oak itself and pin oak. There is a um, uh, sycamore that also gets this disease pretty badly, and that can be, as I mentioned at the bottom, a predisposition to other problems, including uh, anthracnose on sycamore. And in oaks, it can be a predisposition for oak wilt. Um, grape. It's a very serious problem in grape, and it's given the name there of Pierce's disease. And we've started to see it now also on oleander. Now, these are not going to be exactly the same strain of the bacterium on all of these different hosts. There is some host specialization involved. The bacteria, in this case, are colonizing the xylem of the tree or the shrub, and that's where the name comes from of uh, xylaria. The vector is or the vectors are principally leaf hoppers, the sharpshooter type leaf hoppers. I did read about uh, spittle bugs also, but I'm not aware that that's happening in North Carolina. And I guess the fortunate thing about this particular disease, it's very slow to develop and spread. The tree that you see on the right is from the brickyard here at NC State, and this tree has been over a decade in showing symptoms. It starts looking in August like it's already going to fall color, but if you look carefully, then it has the typical scorch symptoms around the edge. And the uh, tree has been in well unthrifty. It's not been growing well. The other trees by it are growing up and competing. But it hasn't died. And interestingly enough, it hasn't spread either. The crown of this tree and the crown of the closest uh, red or pin oak are only about 10 yards away from each other now. But in all that time, nothing has happened to the other tree. So it develops slowly within the tree, and it also spreads slowly to other trees. Again, there can Mike, be you got a couple uh, of questions in the uh, chat box. Um, one of them is, is, is there any treatment? And the other one is, is maple leaf scorch related to a fungus, bacteria, or due to heat and drying wind? Maple leaf scorch that uh, I have seen or heard about is mostly an environmental type problem, a, a drought, heat drought kind of situation. Um, I may have to check up on that, though. But maple is not generally a host for this particular bacterium. And I'm not aware of any fungus causing that. Um, and the other question is about treatment. I'm not aware that pruning really does any good. In fact, there really is no effective treatment for this. If you had an oleander, for example, you might want to uh, consider removing it to reduce the chances of spread. And you certainly wouldn't want to propagate from that, because it is systemic. But there are really no uh, treatments in our landscape trees for this particular um, a drastic pruning, a drastic it, it pruning could work if you got to the got edge to of it before it became com completely systemic within the tree. Uh, I don't know how well that really works. Just kind of a side point, the, um, the grape industry in California has got a really serious problem now with this disease that it didn't, didn't have before, not because they didn't have the bacterium, but because they have a new vector, the uh, glassy wing sharpshooter, that can feed on larger branches. So it gets down into the larger branches of the, of the uh, grapevine more quickly, and, uh, and the pruning isn't going to be as effective. Um, I actually do need to check one other thing here. I believe I said that it was uh, could cause predisposition for uh, for oak wilt. I may have misspoken on that, but there is another disease besides the sycamore anthracnose that this does help predispose trees to as far as other problems.
this is just a curiosity, but I couldn't resist putting it in. This is under hot, humid, wet conditions, mostly on magnolia. Uh, you might also see it on camellia, these spots which are actually not caused by a fungus or bacterium or virus or nematode, but by an alga, one of the few parasitic algae that are around. And uh, this, again, is a curiosity and not going to be a serious problem. And I wouldn't recommend attempting any kind of control for this. We talked about slime molds in the very first session of this summer, and they're still out there. This was a nice filigo septica dog vomit slime mold from also in the brickyard just last week. And uh, at church, I also saw another kind of slime mold last week, so they are out there. But I wanted to talk more about some of the other fungi in our landscape beds. We're going to be seeing mushrooms and boletes and things popping up. Most of these, I would venture to say, are going to be saprophytes feeding off of already dead material and not really causing damage to the plants themselves. And so um, I can't make a blanket statement about that. But in general, that's going to be the case. They're, these are going to be saprophytes that we're seeing. And some of them are even going to be the mycorrhizal fungi that are beneficial to our, our trees. The thing I wanted to focus on, though, as far as a mulch, particular mulch fungus. Oh, excuse me. And here's a far off shot and then a little bit of a closer shot of of a bird's nest fungus, in this case in the genus Cyathus. And within these cups are small, they look like shiny hematite eggs that are called peridials that splash out when rain hits them. And uh, that's how the fungus disseminates the spores. Those things have spores within them. This is not harmful to plants or people. It's merely feeding off of the decaying wood in the, in the mulch. Now, it does have sort of an evil cousin, a related fungus, that causes this particular problem. These are the spore masses. This is actually a sample that came in last month from Avery County, a rhododendron. But these are the spore masses that were not splashed out, but shot violently out of the tiny fruiting bodies of a fungus called Sphorobola stellatus, or the artillery fungus, or the cannonball fungus. And this can be a problem, not so much it's going to do any harm to that rhododendron, but if it happened to be in your house, uh, or on the siding of your house, or on your car, these are extremely difficult to remove and can stain the surface below them. So the, um, the remedy really is uh, it's, it's difficult. There's no fungicides that you can use. You can try replacing with pine bark or uh, other bark mulch. If it's not the hardwood mulch, it should be less uh, invaded by this particular fungus. But uh, if you put on fresh hardwood mulch, then you're really only uh, temporarily solving the problem, because that could reinvade them. And it is, like I say, extremely difficult to remove these. Just to wrap up, then, I want to go back to a theme that we had from the very first session this year, which was the problems that we ourselves caused for our plants. And this is a sample that came in. I don't remember from where exactly, but we've got two things going on. The first is the root system. Let me see if I can get the pencil thing to work here. And what happened here was they just dug a little shallow hole and stuck that little tree in there. And the roots are going up instead of down. And then on top of that, at some point, they came through with their weed whacker and damaged the tree here. So just to put a bug in people's ear out there, I think that a great service to our communities would be for um, there to be some kind of programs on proper tree and shrub planting and proper care of these things in their first year of life, especially when we do see so many problems. So with that, I, time is just about up. But uh, I've got a minute for a question or two, if there would be any more. All right, then let me pass the microphone over to our 
native entomologist, Mr. Dave Stefan. Ah, the question that did come through here, what caused the roots to grow up? Uh, that's a good question. If they weren't just the roots that were present there and got bent toward the surface, that they were, uh, why didn't they re revert themselves to start growing down? These could have been the larger roots that were already present or roots that were already present when the thing went in the ground. So they may have gone through some thickening, but since they only grow at the root tips, that would be at the tips that they would have uh, then righted themselves and started going down again. So I suspect that that's what happened. More typically, we see things like J-rooting, where they yeah, root hit the bottom of the hole, uh, or sometimes roots that uh, strangle the base of the plant, uh, a girdling root, they're called. Good question. All right, once again, pass it over here to Mr. David Stephan. Oops, too many cooks here. Okay, pardon me while I get adjusted. Uh, here, can folks hear me? All right. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, first of all thanking Mike for again for his help in um, my getting this presentation put together. Without that, I would be totally technically lost. And I'd like to thank uh, Will Hooker for his fascinating presentation too. It makes my feeble attempts at gardening with native plants and gardening for wildlife. Uh, pale in comparison, but I can report uh, that I did have five species of woodpeckers and nuthatches nesting in uh, the snags that I'd left in my yard, plus uh, this year for the first time I had a pair of red-headed woodpeckers successfully nest in a pine snag, so that was a plus for me. Okay, but uh, we're not talking about uh, woodpeckers or native plant gardening today, we're talking about insects. And I'm going to start off uh, with a mention about a species of thrips. This um, greenhouse thrips, Heliothrips hemorrhoidalis, on a one of the tropical foliage plants from the zoo, giant torch ginger. The uh, greenhouse thrips belongs to a uh, fairly good-sized group of almost uh, thrips that are almost entirely confined to the tropics in in their natural. Uh, settings, and they are rather small. They're usually about a sixteenth of an inch long or about one to two millimeters in size. They're usually black in color, rather slow moving, and they feed openly on the foliage. Uh, this is pretty dramatic damage on this particular plant. I've seen the greenhouse thrips come in a number of times before on various uh, greenhouse or conservatory foliage plants, but I don't think I've ever seen anything quite this dramatic. I don't know for sure if it was because the thrips were unusually abundant on this plant or because this plant was unusually sensitive to them. But the thrips must have some sort of uh, protection going for them because they're feeding openly on the foliage. They're rather slow. They don't take flight when you pursue them with forceps. So they probably are depending on some sort of chemical protection to uh, guard them against natural enemies. Um, in particular, the larvae of some species are brightly colored. Another one of these tropical foliage species called the red-banded thrips, I've only seen a couple of times come in here, but it's more common to the south, and the larvae are banded with, they have a bright red band across them as if that's some sort of warning color. Uh, the adults, like most of their relatives, are uniformly dark in color, heavily armored, uh, rather coarse looking thrips, but uh, say they're not usually much of a problem outdoors here in North Carolina. The greenhouse thrips and the banded greenhouse thrips are the two species in this group that we most commonly encounter. And occasionally, the banded greenhouse thrips does turn up outdoors. I've seen it on rhododendron, for example, here in North Carolina. This is a close-up image of some of the damage. Most of that that's black or brown spotting you see there are fecal spots. The little red circle is uh, encircling um, I'm not even sure if that's an adult or a larval thrips. I think it's an adult thrips on there. I didn't get any good images of these uh, guys uh, under a microscope, unfortunately, but there's not a whole lot to see. They're, they're just not very charismatic as thrips go, so there's not much to look at. Moving along to uh, bugs, and I use bugs in kind of a general sense of the term. Taxonomists like to lump groups sometimes and split some groups. So. These would be among the bugs, the scale insects and the adelgids. And this poor 
eastern hemlock tree has got a double whammy. It's got heavy infestation of the elongate hemlock scale, which is an introduced species, and also the hemlock woolly adelgid, another and more even more infamous uh, introduced species. This is a um, shows the foliage from above, showing the heavy chlorosis on the, the older needles here, such as we see here. This new growth has not yet become uh, as heavily infested with the scales and the adelgids. Uh, a bit of a close-up from the underside. Now, the elongate hemlock scale, and here, here's one right here, they're sort of oblong in shape. Uh, they're on the underside of the needles, and they do produce a waxy bloom to some degree, so they may have a slightly whitish appearance to them. Uh, this is one of actually two species of scales in the same genus, Fiorinia, that are introduced uh, from the Orient. Uh, I have not seen the other species of Fiorinia in North Carolina yet, but it's probably just a matter of time before it gets here. And just by itself, it can uh, be quite heavy on uh, eastern hemlock and probably also on Carolina hemlock, but I haven't seen it on that host plant yet. Uh, the hemlock woolly well, adelgids are somewhat less conspicuous. They're along the stem here. And back in the spring, they would have been much more conspicuous when the adults were actively reproducing. There would have been large quantities of wax present, the, the fluffy white wax. Now they're in a nymphal state, and they're kind of semi-dormant. Uh, they'll remain this way through the summer and then become active in as weather cools again in the fall. But uh, this tree is uh, in serious peril. Uh, either the adelgid or the scale by itself, uh, certainly the adelgids could kill the tree. Um, now, I have seen parasites, or par I should say parasitoid wasps that are associated with the, sc the scale insect. I don't know if it's an introduced species of a wasp to control the scales or if it's a species of wasp that was already attacking other scales in the genus Fiorinia that were already present in North Carolina and had switched over to attack the elongate hemlock scale. Uh, we can only hope that it's going to continue to proliferate. Okay, um, moving from bugs to beetles. This is, um, partially we couldn't, couldn't get this guy to sit still very well for a, a good, clear shot. The cottonwood leaf beetle is a, a common species throughout North Carolina and indeed throughout much of the eastern half of the U.S. It feeds on uh, true poplars in the genus Populus, also on willows, on genus Salix, and on the uh, alder, uh, Gina aldus. And various species of this genus of leaf beetles, the genus Chrysomella, can be found on those hosts uh, throughout North America, alder, poplar, and willow. And these came from some poplar trees that were growing on an old landfill site in High Point, and they were feeding on the, on the poplar foliage. But fortunately, they, most of these poplar feeding insects will readily switch over to willow and vice versa. So I was rearing these guys on, uh, on the willow, and they started laying eggs because they had plenty of food and they were happy. And uh, here is the uh, result. These are first generation. We have here the pupa of the cottonwood leaf beetle attached to the tip of a leaf. And here is a larva that is in a pre-pupal condition. It has already cemented itself to the stem, and it's just resting until it finally sheds its skin. But when they do shed their skins, as you can see here, the pupa does not come completely free of the skin. It remains attached within the old larval skin, which is still glued to the leaf. And then the pupa uh, just remains there sitting on the leaf until the adult emerges. Now, when these guys are disturbed, they've got these gland pores on the thorax here that it can exude uh, what I assume is a, a nasty smelling or, or nasty tasting chemical that keeps them from being attacked by birds and frogs and lizards and stuff like that. And they look quite a bit like the larvae of lady beetles. As you can see here, this is uh, an active larva of one of these cottonwood leaf beetles. And uh, they are rather similar in appearance to lady beetle larvae, which are themselves, whoops, I went back somehow. 
uh, which are themselves uh, protected chemically from attack by um, various kinds of predators. Now, I'm sure there are some natural enemies uh, out there that will attack these common leaf beetles that are not deterred by the, the chemicals. In nature, if it grows, something's going to eat it. So regardless of what kind of physical or chemical or behavioral defense a uh, critter comes up with, something's going to figure out a way to get around that and, and make a meal out of it. This is some of the damage from the cottonwood leaf beetles. They skeletonize the foliage uh, when they're young like this. When they get older, they may consume the entire leaf if it's fairly tender. And I don't have a picture of the eggs, but they would lay a cluster of uh, sort of pale yellowish eggs uh, on the underside of the leaf. When they're young, the larvae will feed together, and then they may scatter as they get older. OK. Uh, Oops, I don't know what it's doing. It keeps going back like that. All right, uh, these are some green June beetles that are assembled on the trunk of a mimosa tree. And we're going to have a little quiz here. Um, are these beetles, A, participating in a flash mob, B, holding a regularly uh, scheduled property owners association meeting, C, plotting the takeover of some lawn maintenance company, D, hosting a baby shower for a proud mother and her 60 bouncing baby white grubs, or E, enjoying a mimosa. Where do I, do I check for people voting? Right. OK, it looks like uh, most people have got this uh, figured out correctly. These beetles are enjoying a mimosa. And I was asking Mike Munster about this earlier. What do you actually call this thing? I thought it was a slime flux uh, or a frothing sap flow or something like that. But apparently, the technical term for it is alcoholic flux. And this can, there are a number of infections of various kinds that can occur on tree trunks, uh, some of them serious, some of them less so. And uh, there are bacteria in there which are causing the sap to ferment and become actually alcoholic, uh, or at least certainly sweet uh, and attractive to the beetles. I've never seen the green June beetles gathering like this before, but they are having a pretty good time. And if anything, they're going to just help clean some of that up. They're not going to do any damage whatsoever to the tree. And you notice also that there's a lot of variation in the color here. Even though green June beetles are typically green like this, with usually a kind of a a yellowish margin to the sides of the elytra. You can sometimes get individuals that are largely yellowish or orangish in color with just a, a very little green on them. But it's all the same species and just a um, little bit of individual variation among them. OK. Let's see what we've got. Ah, we have the, uh, the identification of the beetle up here. OK. Uh, moving on to uh, butterflies and moths. This is a larva of a viceroy butterfly. And this was another one of those caterpillars that was originally feeding on poplar. And this is from an experiment being conducted by a grad student here in the forestry department. And she's got some plots of uh, poplar out around the state. And she brings me the insects. But I don't have any poplar available here on campus. But I do have willow available in abundance. And this was a young larva when it came in. And now it's just about full grown. And it's got this uh, sort of an irregular pattern here in the lumpy body. And there are a lot of caterpillars that, at least to human eyes, appear to be bird dropping mimics. They've usually got a brown pattern at either end of the body and some sort of white saddle across the middle of the body. The Larvae of swallowtail butterflies in their early stages are all bird dropping mimics. And there are even some adult moths that are bird dropping mimics, or at least they seem to be to, to human eyes. And uh, I need to try and get some pictures of some of this. I probably have a special session just about insects that are imitating bird poop or other kinds of droppings like that. There are some beetles that look like caterpillar droppings and so on, but that would make a, a nice little presentation. This is a, a close uh, head-on view of the larva. And I was going to get an image of the chrysalis of the thing, too. But it, it pupated one just before a weekend uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, barely 10 days later or less, the, the adult had already emerged before I got around to taking a picture of the chrysalis. And the chrysalis is quite bizarre looking in its own right and probably is meant to mimic a piece of torn leaf or dried shrivel leaf and so avoid detection by predators. 
Okay, uh, another bit of a quiz. Um, anybody got an idea what this is? I don't know whether we type in our quest or answers here or call in our answers. Okay. Somebody call geometric. Okay. People are typing on the screen. That'd be a good way. Loopers, yes. Uh, scale insects. Looks like scale insects, doesn't it? Caterpillar. It's a twig. Well, yes, there is a twig in that picture. All right. Uh, caterpillar. Okay. Um, birds and may be fooled, but apparently people are not fooled. This is one of the loopers, or they're also called spanworms or inchworms. Uh, this one has got a couple of common names, and trust me, I did not make any of these names up. This comes out of books. Uh, big cranberry spanworm, uh, also known as the purplish brown looper Eutropila clemataria. And this is the tail end here. This is the head end up here. And uh, many of these uh, loopers, of which there are hundreds of species just uh, here in North Carolina alone, uh, make excellent uh, dead twig mimics. And they can stand there for hours just anchored by the, these two pairs of legs at the tail end of the body with the body sticking out looking like a twig. The, uh, Thoracic legs or true legs will be kind of folded up like air, retracted airplane gear, and they can, in addition, they can have crests like this on the thorax, plus additional tubercles on the abdomen, all of which contribute to breaking up the outline of the caterpillar and making it look for all the world like some inedible dead twig. This one was feeding on. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I just blanked on, on the host plant it was feeding on, sweet gum. But it will also feed on uh, a wide range of uh, other tree species as well. And this thing can be a good two, two and a half inches long when full grown. The, the adult is one of our larger looper moths and often comes to uh, lights at night around here. They are never so abundant, at least in my experience, as to be causing any significant damage to any of the trees they're feeding on. And there's really no need to worry about trying to control them. Okay, uh, this is the time of year when uh, many wasps are active, and especially the social species like yellow jackets, hornets, paper wasps. Um, the colonies are approaching their mature size, and uh, they will begin to produce next year's generation of queens. Uh, there are probably some of them that are already in their cells right now, developing either as uh, larvae or as, as pupae, uh, which will soon emerge. And uh, I went around. We have a nice big hackberry tree right outside the building here, which is infested with uh, a hackberry woolly aphid, another introduced species that I believe we covered once before. And they're just dripping down a constant rain of uh, honeydew that accumulates on foliage underneath and uh, also on any vehicles that are parked under the tree. And this attracts the attention of many species of bees and wasps and flies that, that come in for the, uh, for the dried honeydew secretion. So I went out there the other day in a, a sweep net and I started collecting things and just to get some representative examples. And these are paper wasps, the polistes species, of which we have several here in North Carolina. And these are the ones that build those upside down single tiered nests that you see uh, hanging underside the uh, eaves of a house, uh, sometimes in shrubbery. There's one rather large species that likes to uh, build its nests uh, overhanging lakes and, and rivers. It'll be out on a limb there, which is no fun if you're a canoer and you happen to get under one of those things without noticing. And next thing you know, you've got a cloud of angry paper wasps on your head and, and no solid ground to go dashing across to escape them. Uh, I thought I had a couple of different species when I was sweeping them off the foliage, but on closer inspection, they all seem to be the same thing. Uh, these are alive. No insects were harmed in the filming of this movie here. And uh, they were simply narcotized with a little carbon dioxide. And later, I took them back outside and, and released them all to return to their colonies. This is a close-up of one of those paper wasps here. You can see they're, they're 
this particular species, and I confess I don't know which one this is, is fairly colorful. You can have some degree of variation within the same species between the uh, queen and, and male and uh, worker castes, uh, and also uh, just individual variation uh, within a species. So it's you'd think it'd be fairly uh, easy to identify these these different species, polistes, but it's it's not quite that easy. It's a pretty good sized group, especially when you go south of the border down into Central and South America. And here in the U.S., we probably have at least a dozen different species, maybe more. And uh, I wish I could uh, separate them a little more reliably than I'm capable of doing. The um, black and yellow mud dog or wasp was another common species out there. And this is a species that's familiar to most people because of the nests that they build uh, on the sides of buildings, sometimes even inside buildings. If they've got an open window, they can come through. It's got a lovely name, Skelephron cementarium. And this is one of the uh, solitary hunting wasps. And these guys attack small caterpillars, excuse me, small spiders, which they pack into their nest. And you can see their abdomens are on this long, flexible segment here. So they're very flexible. They can bend the abdomen in all different directions and uh, zap either the spider they're attacking or some unwary entomologist who tries to grab one of these things. Not that most entomologists would do such a thing like that. We, we do have respect for things that sting. Here's a little bit of a close-up of them. Again, these guys were just narcotized with carbon dioxide. It's a great way to slow things down. It keeps them slowed down longer than simply chilling in the refrigerator would do. And you know, maybe they've got bad headaches after a little CO2, or maybe they've got a good buzz going. It's really hard to tell what goes on inside the, the head of some of these things. But here are some pictures from right outside Gardner Hall. This is the Phytotron, which is uh, right next to Gardner Hall. And I noticed one day that on the south wall, the south facing wall of Phytotron, there was just one after another. There were the, all these mud dauber nests under this uh, slight brig overhang. Uh, this is about three or four feet above the ground. Uh, if I were to go up 20 feet, there would be another overhang. There were almost none there, nor were there any mud dauber nests on the north facing wall of Gardner Hall, just 30 feet away across the sidewalk in a garden. They were all preferentially being built uh, on this presumably very warm south facing wall. It's what they seem to like. And you can see by the different colors of the nest that they were utilizing mud from different sources in the construction of their nests. So the nests uh, typically look like just handfuls of mud that have been, you know, somebody's picked up and just plastered there. But in fact, they're carefully constructed uh, tubes. And they're built parallel to each other. It's kind of like, a, think of a stacks loaves of bread at the grocery store that, that are kind of molded in between with the mud. And each one of these individual cells will be packed full of small spiders. And then the, the wasp will lay her egg in there and then seal it up. And sometimes they grow in an irregular fashion like this. But in uh, here's an individual tube. You can get a better idea of the shape of the thing. There is another species of specid wasp, a different genus in the same family as the black and yellow mud dauber, which after the black and yellow mud daubers have exited their nest, it will come along and use the same vacant nest over again. And I didn't get a picture of that one, but it's a little bit smaller, and it's a deep metallic blue color all over. And uh, it just recycles the nest uh, rather than building new ones all by itself. Now, in addition to the other wasp recycling the nest, Spiders will sometimes use the nest. And uh, this is a, the webbing of a very common species of spider around here in North Carolina, sometimes called the, the uh, brown house, excuse me, the southern house spider. And it's commonly mistaken for the brown recluse, but it's not related to it. And I'm going to have to do a, another presentation sometime, which includes some of our common domestic spiders. But they have uh, got all their the trip lines out around the, uh, the these old nests, and the spider is hidden somewhere back in one of these cavities here, just waiting for some unwary insect to stumble across these trap trip lines, and then it'll come dashing out and grab the prey. Another one of the wasps that I encountered when I was out there is one of the potter wasps. Now, I'd love to be able to tell you that this was the hairy potter wasp, but I'm afraid I can't do that. But I had to throw that in anyway. 
Potter wasps are also solitary, and uh, some of them will construct the fairly uh, intricate uh, little urn-shaped nests, uh, one for each one of their larvae, which they'll then pack with small caterpillars. Others will take mud and pack it into uh, an in abandoned uh, bore gallery of some kind to get it down to the appropriate diameter. And others will simply just use whatever pre-existing cavity they can find, but they don't excavate their own. Uh, we have many genera and species of these potter wasps around here. They range in size, usually from a quarter inch to three quarters of an inch long. Typically, they're black with a, either a yellow or a whitish pattern. And uh, like all of the solitary wasps and bees, they are not aggressive. They do not uh, defend in a colony site, and they will not uh, come stinging you unless you actually grab one of these things in your bare hand. Just another shot of the same species I'm holding in the tip of the forceps. Uh, it, too, has been narcotized with the CO2. OK. Um, OK, we've got about five minutes to go here. And I would like to give a shout out to a couple of kinds of plants. I don't usually do this, but I should do it on a more frequent basis. This is one of my personal favorite small trees. It's been uh, called the Harlequin Glory Bower, also called Cashmere Bouquet, and probably goes by some other names. It is uh, it's Clarodendrum Trichotomum, another one of those names that just kind of rolls off the tongue. And Clarodendrum is a large genus of tropical plants. There's probably some 400 species that are named. And the vast majority of them are very frost sensitive. You just can't uh, grow them year round outdoors this far north in a zone 7 here. Uh, many of them make uh, good hanging basket plants. Uh, they can be trees. They can be herbaceous. They can be vines. But this particular one is quite cold hardy in this area. And I've seen a few of them around. And it's a species that I think deserves uh, a lot more attention than it gets. Uh, I've only seen a handful of them around, and usually they're in older yards. I don't see them in uh, around new homes anymore. It's blooming at a time of the year when there are a few other things out there blooming. And let me go back a sec. And this one happens to be planted uh, right next to a crepe myrtle. It doesn't have as long a blooming season as crepe myrtle, but I think it's a much nicer tree when it is in bloom. It's got these you know, big masses of, of blooms. Uh, this picture was taken last Friday, and you can see from the buds here that most of the blooms have not even opened yet. And you get a little bit closer in, and you can you appreciate how beautiful it is. And not only that, but it has a knockout beautiful uh, aroma to it, just wonderfully sweet fragrance. Uh, you can be walking along a street. You won't be able to see one of these things. And all of a sudden, the breeze will carry this aroma to you. And you say, whoa, what is that? So this one is uh, one that uh, I say people should uh, consider planting uh, in their yards. It's, a, it's about the size of a small dogwood tree, 15, 20 feet high, kind of rounded form to it. But uh, write that name down, Clarodendrum trichotomum, and uh, see if you can uh, find it around. Now, in addition, come fall, these uh, will all uh, produce uh, deep blue fruit surrounded by red calices. And so it's attractive in fruit as well as in bloom. All right. Now, is it attractive um, to bees, Dave? Uh, I have there's a question, is it attractive? Time. Yes, I have not spent enough time just staring at it. When I was looking at this one uh, last Friday, taking the pictures, I didn't notice any bees, but there, there must be something coming to it and pollinating it. I'll have to go back and, and check this tree out and, and see whether there are honeybees or bumblebees or, or native uh, bees coming to it and see what's going on. And uh, well, we're not going to have another one of these, so I can't mention it. But um, if somebody emails me a question about that, I'll respond to them. OK, last plan I cover, I'm going to go for a weed. And I've been seeing this thing in lawns uh, in recent years. And I had assumed, because of the way it was behaving, that it was some sort of exotic invasive. It turns out it's a native plant called Virginia buttonweed, Diodea virginiana. But it is known to be a bad actor getting into lawns and uh, sometimes causing uh, quite a problem. Uh, it has small, white, four-petaled flowers. It uh, typically it's green like this, but as you saw, it can also be rather yellow like this. Uh, this is actually all part of the same clump here, and some of the foliage is yellow and some of it's green. And it's rather difficult to control with herbicides. I was looking online, finding information about it, and uh, it says 
the better way, the best way to control it is just go after it by hand, trying to dig it up, because spraying it with conventional herbicides does not seem to do a good job of killing it. It'll kill back the tops, but it doesn't seem to get to the roots. So, a native plant causing problems in lawn situations, uh, one to be on the watch for. There's a little bit of a close-up of the flower, and while I was taking the picture, I didn't even notice some of this chlorosis on the foliage. So one of my little friends, uh, could be thrips, could be a leaf hopper or a plant hopper of some kind, has been feeding here. I'm going to have to go back and look and see what is going after this plant. So, with that, I'll open it to any questions. Okay. Some comments here. Ah, okay. I have not noticed that it was invasive. Perhaps uh, people have been mowing uh, the lawns that are around the tree and keep it from uh, spreading. So I, I haven't seen that in many of them. I've only seen a handful of trees in, in the Raleigh area. So uh, appreciate that uh, warning. I have not seen plants popping up from seeds, though. About was about uh, hardiness, and this is what they have to say here. Okay. Just, just tell them to check out. You've got to look in the fourth edition of, of, uh, of Deer's Manual. It was in the first edition. All right. It's it's in the Durr's Manual of uh, woody landscape plants. I also uh, was looking in a uh, another botanical text, which includes several of the species, and most of them were hardy only from zone nine or ten on south. But there were a couple of species, including this one, which were reportedly hardy here in zone seven. Do uh, no, green, the adult green June beetles occasionally will get on fruit. Uh, they, they've been reported to, say, feed on peaches occasionally on the fruit, but uh, they don't very often do so, at least not frequently enough that uh, they get reported doing so. The, uh, and the larvae themselves, even though they're white grubs, uh, feed on dead vegetation. They don't feed on the living roots of grass the way, for example, Japanese beetles do. But if you have a compost pile with, with lawn clippings or lots of green kitchen scraps or other green vegetation, that's what they really love. They will not uh, lay their eggs in compost that's just, say, rakes dead leaves. That's too low in nitrogen to attract their attention. Okay, somebody added that uh, Virginia white buttonweed is quite resistant to the glyphosate. Confront, okay. All right. Uh, if you other have any other questions, you can uh, address them directly to Mike or myself by email. And uh, if that's that, we will say goodbye until next year. David. David, yes. before you go, please, uh, you did okay. have a question here. How do you identify hawk moth caterpillars? All right, hawk moth caterpillars, uh, they're called um, by other names the, uh, the hornworm or sphinx moth. And there's quite a few species of them around here. Most of them feed on native trees and plants and don't cause damage to crops. Of course, species like the tomato hornworm and the tobacco hornworm uh, will feed on tomato and tobacco. Both species feed on both plants. There are a few species which uh, cause occasional damage to uh, other plants in the garden. Uh, Datura uh, has, will be attacked by some of these caterpillars. But uh, typically, they are large in size. Um, even the smallest ones are at least a couple inches long. And almost all species have that uh, typical horn on the tail end of the body, uh, which is harmless. It's not poisonous or anything like that. It's just there for decoration. A few species of hornworms in the last larval stage, the horn is lost, but a sort of button or tubercle is left in its place. OK. Yes, uh, some of the hawk moths uh, do have eye spots uh, on the body, as do, for example, larvae of some of these swallowtail butterflies that, that give them kind of a snake's head looking appearance. And uh, the certainly, especially with the swallowtail butterflies, that can be very effective uh, looking into an end of a rolled up leaf and you see the caterpillar in there and looks for all over like the head of a snake looking back out at you.
Dave and Michael, and big thanks to, to both of you. Really tremendously appreciate all that you have done to respond to, to requests from agents and, and the work that you've done to get the botanical names of or scientific names of, of insects and diseases on the slides and all the different slides. It just um, really, really appreciate that very much. Oh, uh, couple uh, this, of this is Mike again. Mike again. Um, yeah. Um, just to mention, there was a question that had come up earlier. There are no chemical treatments registered for uh, xylella, the bacterial scorch diseases. And I have to, do have to be careful because scorch is used for different diseases, but there are none that I could tell that are registered. And the question had to do with these uh, so-called systemic coppers, and I'm extremely skeptical about those, but for reasons that we cannot get into, we don't have time. But um, yeah, there's no chemical treatment for, for xylella scorch. Thanks. Here are a couple of um, websites that you might be interested in as, as you're pursuing more information about the, the topics that have been brought up on the, the presentation. There's a link to the insects site at NCSU, to turf files, to the Ag Chem manual, to the plant disease clinic, mm -hmm. and to the urban hort site. So, all of those are ones that will have more detailed information and, and this will be available, this session from today will be available online at the Plants, Pests, and Pathogens website um, soon as it gets processed. The Summer Green and Growing show is in Greensboro this week. There's the website address for the show if you're interested in going and the Master Gardener Conference is going to be in Mooresville October 4th through the 7th. We're going to have an in-service training for for extension agents on volunteer management. It's a full day in service at the conference. So hope to see you all there. Does anybody else have dates or upcoming things or anything that you want to share with the group as a whole before we uh, adjourn? Okay, I will um, be um, putting my heads together with the other guys that are part of bringing this program to you and we will be sending out a survey to, to look at how we want to, to move forward with this in the future. So thank all of you guys for participating and thank you for your patience as we transition to a whole new strategy for bringing the program to you and uh, we'll look forward to getting your input both through the survey or if you want to contact any of us individually we'd, we'd love to hear from you that way as well. Talk to you soon. October 10th, Pasquotank plant sale.